Okay, seems like we're ready to get started. So I'd like to welcome you to this presentation. Uh, my name is Tad Kamasik, and I'm a formal, for, former Science Olympiad competitor, just like you. And my AC system in my uh, office just uh, made a little a sound, sorry about that. Uh, I competed in Science Olympiad when I was in middle and high school from 2004 to, to 2009, and I really enjoyed the astronomy event. And so now I work as a volunteer event supervisor for the astronomy event, and I've been doing so since 2010 when I graduated high school. And we formed as, as a team, an A team of supervisors who are all alumni, uh, kind of led by Donna Young, who's our rock as, as a team. And so tonight, we're fortunate to hear from NASA scientist, Dr. Stephanie Mylom, who will talk about her career as a scientist, how the Webb telescope is unique, and what we will learn from it. After Dr. Mylom's presentation, you'll also have the chance to hear from some Science Olympiad alumni, including myself, members of our A-team, as we discuss how the Webb telescope connects to what you're learning and preparing for in this year's Science Olympiad events. Dr. Mylom, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm so grateful to get to talk to you all about um, a little bit about myself as well as um, what's going on with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, as was said, my name is Stephanie Milam. Um, I work at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and I'm the Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary Science on the James Webb Space Telescope. I wanted to start with a little bit about myself. Um, I, I come from Texas. I was born and raised um, in Tex Houston, Texans, Texas. Um, I was a little girl with very big dreams. I had my first... Um, actual tour of NASA's Johnson Space Center when I was about six years old. I went for a school field trip and I came home just completely wide-eyed and excited and I ran to my mother and I told her that when I grew up I was going to work for NASA and be an astronaut or I was going to be a ballerina. I um, I'd been dancing since I was two years old and um, ballet was sort of my passion. But at that point in time, I knew that I wanted to definitely work for NASA. Um, nobody in my family had a higher education of any sort. Um, there was a, a little bit of technical degree um, spattered across my, my siblings and my parents, um, but nobody had a formal um, education beyond high school, really. And so I was really the first person to, to pursue getting not only my bachelor's degree in science, but also to go all the way through my education up through um, my doctorate in philosophy, um, which I did. I was able to achieve that um, pretty quickly, actually, considering um, how long it takes to get a science degree. Um, so I got both of my degrees in chemistry, ironically. Um, this was due to multiple reasons and circumstances. Um, one was I, I actually got a dance and academic scholarship to go to school. Um, and so I ended up going to a school that didn't have um, an engineering program that I was interested in pursuing. I, I thought at the time I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. Um, and so what they had was sort of these um, programs that trained you in physics and math and um, physical science such that you could go on to a professional degree after your first few years at the university. And so um, I ended up doing this, uh, joining or, or going to a, a small liberal arts school in the middle of Kansas to get my bachelor's of science in chemistry. And I chose chemistry for multiple reasons. One being, I knew it was um, something I was very good at and passionate about, but also if everything with the whole NASA situation didn't um, come to fruition, I knew that I would always be employable as a chemist. Um, chemists work in every aspect of society. I mean, everything from helping to make food and preservatives and other products to, you know, testing air quality, water quality for cities and um, states, um, as well as, you know, more on the business side of, you know, 
um, pharmaceutical companies all the way up into management there, as well as advisory committees to um, officials. So chemistry was, was my path. And um, when I got to choosing my PhD, where I was going to get my, my higher degree, um, I decided that I had burnt out basically all of my, my motivation of being a chemist pretty quickly um, and told my advisor that I no longer wanted to ever wash a beaker or any glassware again in the laboratory. Um, at the time, um, during my undergraduate degree, I was working in an, an industry. I was actually working in an environmental laboratory testing ground soil and water quality. And I also had an internship as an assistant winemaker, and I did that for three years, and that was a lot of fun. So testing how much alcohol was in wine and what the sugar level was of the various wines and um, other, other types of tests that need to be done routinely. So um, I pursued my PhD actually doing something called astrochemistry. So my laboratory then went from you know, a bench top um, where I was washing glassware continuously for a living um, to now I was using telescopes and my laboratory was now the entire universe. So um, it, was a, it was a very um, huge step as far as my career went because it's basically what has defined everything I've done and led me on my journey. But let's talk about James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, this telescope was actually conceived um, from the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Hubble Space Telescope had um, amazing capability, in fact, something that we weren't even really expecting. And this was so astonishing to everybody, including the director of the telescope, that he actually set aside a lot of time to basically stare into what we thought was blank space, some, a place in the sky where we'd never really observed any other object before. And he just kind of wanted to see what we could see. And so by doing so, um, they spent a number of days staring at this blank patch of sky. It was about the size of a postage stamp um, just off the shoulder of the moon. And what they found was this image. And this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image. And in this postage stamp, there are 10,000 galaxies. And you can see that they range in all kinds of, of colors, structures. You can see some of them are spiral, some of them are blobby, some of them are just fuzzy dots. Um, some of them are kind of haloed. This was absolutely astonishing to the astrophysics community and the people that had been working on the design and implementation for the Hubble Space Telescope. And so what they wanted to do was see what they could actually see. And Hubble was actually able to see further into the universe than anybody ever expected it to be able to, be able to do. And so this is sort of a depiction of um, going through that deep telescope or that deep image of Hubble, that Hubble actually took. And basically what we're doing is we're marching back in time. So you're walking through the galaxies that are closest to us, which are actually the oldest. They're almost the same age as our own. And then as you, we get further and further, you'll see that they start losing their structure. They start becoming much more blobby. We don't see as many spirals anymore. And basically they all start becoming these fuzzy dots and there's not nearly as many of them. And we don't know if this, the structure of galaxies is something that only happens um, later in galaxy evolution or if the very first stars and galaxies actually had some sort of structure that we see in the sky today. So this was very curious to us. And they actually decided that to get even further in time to go further back towards the beginning of the universe to see the very first stars and galaxies, we had to go to longer wavelengths so that we can see back in time. And so this is sort of a graphic showing you what that actually looks like pictorially. So the deep field is this sort of top um, line that you see going back in time, where the left is current time or us in the modern universe. And on the right hand side is where the Big Bang happened. And then we have um, the dark age after the cosmic microwave background was scattered. Um, and then the first stars and galaxies that started forming and appearing. So Hubble's reaching sort of at the, let's say, teenage years of the first stars and galaxies. And JWST, by going to longer wavelength, will actually give us access to going into sort of the toddler and maybe even the infant years of the first galaxies. So this is sort of where we've pushed um, the technology 
and the capability of space missions. We want to see further. We also want to have the same kind of amazing resolution that Hubble has. We want those fantastic pictures that we've been getting all these years from the Hubble Space Telescope, but we just want them to go back further in time so that we can get a, a full family album now of the first stars and galaxies. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the science motivation behind Webb, and then I'll go into some of the technical details about the observatory. So we have four sort of major themes of, of the James Webb Space Telescope, and these actually help drive not only um, the design of the telescope, but things like the instrumentation that we have, um, as well as other um, technical details, including things like how fast we can track a moving target in the sky, um, how good the pointing has to be, whether or not we can survey a lot of objects or not. These kinds of details are all motivated and guided and really designed around these science themes. And so the first science theme is actually crisscrossing the early universe. We really want to see that sort of beginning of reionization. So when stars first begin forming and heating gas, they start condensing material starts actually um, gravitationally start pulling on themselves. And these stars actually start assembling into galaxies. They become more and more massive. And eventually they, they form into the clear universe of reionization. So now all this hazy dust and gas that was there in the surrounding area is now sort of starting to disperse. So as you can think of a cloudy, hazy day where you can barely see anything in the sky, besides just fuzz versus actual little puffy white clouds that look like almost cotton balls in the sky. That's sort of what we're thinking happened at the very beginning. We went from this really hazy era to now we have distinct galaxies and stars and regions within the universe where we can see actual star formation and galaxy formation. Um, so this is something we're hoping to really get some insight into as we move in into um, the web era of, of astrophysics. So talking a little bit about how um, we're gonna study the early universe is basically we're studying redshift. So redshift is defined um, from how light is actually traveling through our expanding universe. The universe is constantly moving in a direction away from us. So that actually stretches light to longer wavelengths, even though that light itself was not necessarily infralight infrared light as it was emitted. Um, it's just now stretched to longer wavelengths because it's actually traveling away from us. So it's almost like having the Doppler effect of a train that's approaching you sounds a lot faster and a lot sharper pitch versus something that's going away from you. The same sort of thing, this light is actually traveling away from us. So it looks and actually is observed at longer wavelengths. So this is the redshift or how we actually study the ancient universe. <clears throat> the other thing we really want to study and that has motivated the web design is ga galactic evolution. We really want to understand how galaxies have evolved over time. So as I showed you when we were going through the deep field um, through that video, you saw that the galaxies at the very beginning were very well defined with structure and a lot of characteristic, whereas as we got to the end of the video, everything sort of became fuzzy and hazy. We want to see how these galaxies actually evolve with redshift and see if the very first galaxies even had sort of structure or any defining characteristics as we see in the universe today. So, but the most distant and earliest galaxies are pretty much small blobs or less structured than those in our nearby universe. Um, but we also have yet to detect the earliest galaxies in our universe. And that's hopefully something we'll do with what Black holes, this is a very hot topic in astrophysics right now. We're going to be looking through dust to study the center of our own galaxy at Sagittarius A complex and the stars that actually orbit it to study that black hole. We'll take high resolution spectra or um, basically studying the fingerprints of given molecules to learn about the temperatures, the speeds, the composition and material of other galaxies so that we can study their black holes in comparison and get a better fundamental understanding of that evolution. We also hope to address the big question of which came first, the chicken or the egg, or in astrophysics, which came first, the galaxy or a black hole. 
We also want to look at how stars form and live and die. At optical wavelengths um, that we have actually been able to study these areas, um, for example, with the Hubble Space Telescope, just like our own clouds in our sky, everything that's behind these clouds is actually obscured. So any light that's coming from, say, a star behind the clouds or anything within them is something we can't see at visible light, um, the same way clouds block with own, our own sunlight from us. But as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, you can actually start seeing through these objects. Um, so this is a Hubble Space Telescope image, and you'll see as we shift into the infrared, you see that all these stars start appearing and we can see inside of these giant dust and gas clouds. This is where, this is the nurseries of new stars and planets that are forming. So we'll be able to study that process and understand how stars live and die. Since the conception of the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, the discovery and now ubiquitous nature of planets around other stars has become a, a, an amazing topic now in astrophysics um, and planetary science in general. And so at these wavelengths, we actually have sensitivity to seeing the thermal emission of planets around their own stars. And we do this through two techniques. One is using um, a coronagraph, which was just shown in this video, which I'll play again for you. This is where we actually take um, a device and we block out the light from the star so that the light of fainter objects around it actually can come through and becomes visible to us so that we can image them, track them, and see if we can actually constrain the orbits of these planets. The other way we do this is through transit spectroscopy. So this is when a planet actually passes in front of its star and it blocks out a certain amount of light causing the flux from that star to actually decrease. Oops. Um, so as you'll see, as this planet goes in front of the star, the brightness actually drops. And the bigger the planet, the more the brightness is, in, is affected by um, the transit. And by doing this, we can not only study how large the planet is, how often it orbits, but we can also do things like study the atmospheres of these planets um, to get a better understanding of what they're actually made of and if any of them happen to have a chemistry that may or may not be comparable to Earth's. Speaking of Earth, this is what the infrared spectrum of Earth actually looks like. So you can see if we had James Webb pointing at an Earth-like planet, um, the kinds of molecular fingerprints that we would be looking for. So every molecule has a very specific spectrum, or you can think of it as their own fingerprint, just like you have a distinguishable, distinguishable fingerprint from me, every molecule has its own fingerprint as well. So we can actually look for these fingerprints in these planets and study what their, what their atmospheres are actually made of and see if there's a chemistry that may or may not point to something on that body happening to cause a unique chemistry by some process. Maybe it's geologic, maybe it's biologic. Um, these are big questions coming up in the next generation of astronomy. And of course, the solar system. Uh, James Webb has a funny shape and design, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, but because of that shape and design, we can actually observe things in the solar system, but we can't point the telescope towards the sun or the Earth. So that means we're basically restricted to Mars sort of on outward in the solar system. But this does include things like comets that come into the inner solar system, asteroids, and near-Earth asteroids as well. So we have actually a lot of space to explore and study our own solar system and answer questions that we still don't have um, direct answers to today. This is sort of a snapshot of the kind of science we'll be doing or the kinds of objects we'll be studying in our solar system. And you see it's pretty much everything, Mars on outwards, including comets, asteroids, Mars, Jupiter and its satellites, Saturn and its satellites and rings. Uranus and satellites and all the small bodies in the outer solar system. One really cool thing that we're gonna try to do is actually study ocean worlds. So some of these moons around Jupiter and Saturn have been shown um, or have been observed and measured to have uh, outgassing little spurts or geysers coming from the surface of these bodies. Um, Hubble Space Telescope has actually imaged this um, emission coming from Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter. 
as shown here. The blue sort of contours are the, the cartoon version of the emission that was actually measured and observed. With James Webb, we'll actually have capability to take and dissect the full image across the, the whole surface of this body and its plumes and determine what the composition is, not only of the plumes itself, but if they leave any sort of deposits on the surface. So think like a volcano would leave lava on the surface of, of Earth. The same thing could probably happen when these um, plumes are occurring on these, on these planets. Of course, all the small bodies in the solar system are of interest, especially probably everybody's favorite, which is Pluto. We had the recent New Horizons mission, which flew by Pluto, which gave us impeccable resolution and all kinds of information and scientific return that made that mission, mission a huge success. Well, James Webb's not going to have the same resolution as a flyby mission, um, we do have a comparable resolution to what the Hubble Space Telescope has. And these were the images that Hubble did right before the New Horizons mission hat, um, flew by. And you can see there's dark and light features across the surface, including in the center picture, the, the quote, heart of Pluto is even identifiable. With Webb, we're going to have the same sort of imaging resolution, but each one of these little um, dark and light features, we can actually gain a full spectrum. New Horizons did this in, in its limited capability and limited spectral coverage, but you can see the light side versus the dark side um, on that particular um, perspective of Pluto that the mission had. And you can see that the, the lines here in the spectra are very different, suggesting that the composition of something at the pole is very different than the composition of something, say, in the heart of Pluto. With Webb, we'll actually be able to do this across the pole surface and not only one side because we're not flying by, so we can actually allow the planet to rotate and study it in further detail. And alas, let's talk about the telescope itself. Uh, the Webb telescope is a huge feat of engineering. It stands over two feet tall, the, or two stories, excuse me, tall. Um, the sunshade is about the size of a tennis court. The whole thing is absolutely huge. In fact, it's so big that we have to fold it up to put it inside of a rocket. So it's like an origami telescope. Um, but even then, we also had to be able to get this huge telescope up into space. So a lot of engineering went into lightweighting the materials and making sure it was something that we could actually launch onto, with a rocket out to a million miles away from Earth. So just a perspective of how big it actually is, uh, the diameter of James Webb's primary mirror, which is a large gold mirror, um, is about 6.5 meters or over 21 feet high. So for comparison, you can see Hubble's mirror, which is um, only almost eight feet high, and then the standard human um, standing there on the side. I'm slightly shorter than a standard human, um, being only five foot three. So you can see this mirror is actually very impressive to stand next to, which I've had the privilege of doing. But we need this resolution at longer wavelengths, or the size of this mirror, a longer wavelength, so that we can actually get the same sort of image quality that the Hubble Space Telescope had. There's an inverse relationship with the size of the mirror versus the wavelength that the telescope operates at. And since James Webb is an infrared telescope as opposed to an optical telescope that Hubble is, we needed a much bigger mirror to actually get the same resolution. We've also tested this telescope. We're going to send it a million miles away from Earth, which means we're not going to be able to go and fix anything if it doesn't work. So we've actually designed the mirror to actually help focus itself. Each one of these segments, each eight of the 18 segments, has um, full range of motion. We have um, controls on them so that we can move each of them independently. And by doing this, we can actually make them all point to one spot in the sky and act as a single mirror. This is called wavefront sensing and control, which is basically the technical term that we're using, or phrase that we're using, that's um, defining how we can control the mirrors and make them work as one. But this is a really cool technology that's actually spun off of what we've done at NASA and is now employed in um, all kinds of optical studies, including research in cataracts, um, keratoconus, um, as well as eye movement and improvements with LASIK procedures. 
So this has been a huge technology gain, not only for NASA as for space and telescopes, but also for society in improving vision and eyesight repair. And if you're interested in learning more about that, it's, it's something that I highly recommend. And you can Google uh, wave front sensing and control the James Webb. This is what the telescope actually looks like. It's a funny looking shape um, compared to other space telescopes. The most noticeable thing is the big gold mirror, which is our primary mirror. Underneath it is the sun shield and spacecraft. And then of course, behind the mirror is the heart of the telescope. This is where all of our instruments, including spectrometers and cameras actually live. Hmm. We have four instruments. Um, these were provided by all of the agencies involved in this mission. This is not only a NASA mission, it is actually a joint partnership with the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency working with NASA. Um, while NASA is holding the primary um, load of the responsibility for the mission, we have significant contributions from our international partners, one of which being instrumentation. So the mid-infrared instrument is our only instrument that operates outside of five microns, and it goes up to 28 microns with both imaging and spectroscopy capabilities, and it was provided by the European Space Agency. The near-infrared camera was built at the University of Arizona, and it's our workhorse instrument. This is the instrument we actually use to focus the telescope. Not only that, but it also is a science instrument and is going to do all of our deep imaging um, in the near-infrared wavelengths. We have a fine guiding sensor and a near-infrared slitless spectrograph. The spectrometer was specifically designed to do exoplanet studies, covering the full near-infrared in one fell swoop at a resolution that's unique for exoplanet science. And it was provided by the Canadian Space Agency. And then the near-infrared spectrometer, which was also provided by the European Space Agency, is our workhorse spectrometer. This is our near-infrared spectrometer operating from about 0.6 to 5 microns, um, covering all kinds of essential molecules and fingerprints that we need to study things like prebiotic chemistry. So why is a telescope shape so funny? Well, basically, this giant sunshade is actually the same kind of shade, or sunshield is the same kind of shade that you would think of an umbrella. It's shading and protecting um, the primary telescope from the sun and radiation from the Earth and moon as well. So you can think of it as a, in the same manner. So we have actually the hot side of the telescope, which would be the top side of the umbrella, which is at about 185 degrees Fahrenheit, versus the cold side of the telescope, which is almost minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, um, just by sitting in the shade uh, behind these five layers of our sun shield which are um, almost like a, a fancy mylar. It's uh, insulated, capped on, but you can think of it as like happy birthday balloons that have been sewn together to make at the size of a tennis court um, and in multiple layers. Um, it gives us an SPF of about a million, which is quite significant considering. Five minutes, We're going Dr. a million Milo. miles away, thank you, um, to the second Lagrange point. So this is actually, we're going to be orbiting always on the outward side of the sun from the earth. So we're always staying in this path that's on the opposite side of the sun, um, but we're always aligned with the earth and sun, but we're in an orbit around it um, so that we're not actually ever in the shadow of the earth or the moon. We always have direct access to the sun for power and we also have direct access to the earth for communications. This is a massive telescope, as I said, and so we had to figure out how to launch it into space and fit it into the fairing of an Ariane 5 rocket. So to do so, we have to fold it up like origami and stuff it into this fairing, which means we launch it in this sort of folded configuration. And we have a whole month to unfold the telescope and deploy all of the mechanisms to make sure this telescope is in its finally fully um, unfolded and configured uh, observatory to do full operations. It takes about a month to get to the second Lagrange point and it takes about a month to unfold the telescope. So we have a full month of terror after our launch on December 18th. We recently located to the launch facility in French Guiana. Um, Ariane 5 is the major contributor from our European Space Agency collaboration. 
Um, it is our rocket that we're launching on. It is a very stable rocket and a very trusty rocket. So we left Northrop Grumman in California about a month ago, had our long journey through the Panama Canal and arrived in French Guiana. We are now, we have unloaded the telescope from its shipping container and it is now um, being cleaned and getting prepped to be implemented into the rocket. We're looking forward to our next set of discoveries. I talked to you a little bit about some of the science. I'm happy to answer questions or have further discussion on any of those topics. Um, I'm personally not an expert in a lot of the astrophysics, but I'll do the best that I can or I can help you find answers. So with that, I'm happy to take questions and um, I'm looking forward to the next generation of science. Thank you so much, Dr. Milan. That was um, amazing. And we really appreciate all of the great information. Um, if you all have questions for Dr. Milan, please put them in the chat and we will get to them in a couple of minutes. We're going to bring on our A team right now. And um, Dr. Milan, if you wouldn't mind um, unsharing your screen so we can get everybody on the screen. Um, and I want to get the A team to introduce themselves as well, as soon as we all get everybody pinned and ready to go. That's just a, a moment I, here. I will say there seems to be a lot of messages directly to me. Um, maybe they should send them to you. Okay, um, that would be great. That'd be great. And we're missing one more. Where is uh, Aditya? Give us one moment here. He's pinned, Katrina. He's pinned? Okay, great. All right, awesome. Um, so uh, Tad already uh, introduced himself. I'd love um, for Connor and Aditya to do that as well. Uh, tell us who you are, when, uh, how long you did Science Olympiad, what your favorite events were, and then we'll get into our questions about this year's events. Connor, you wanna start us off? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Connor Todd. It's great to virtually meet all of you. Um, like Tad, I competed in Science Olympiad back in high school and I enjoyed doing it so much that I came on as a volunteer to uh, work with Tad and Donna and all the rest of the A-team for the past couple of years now. Great, Aditya. Everyone, my name is Aditya Shah and I'm in uh, I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. I competed in Science Olympiad for six years um, in middle school and in high school at Beckendorf Junior High and Seven Lakes High School in Texas. I competed in a lot of different events, but one of my favorites was definitely astronomy and also solar system. Um, after I graduated from high school, I reached out to Donna and Tad to ask about volunteering to help out with astronomy as an alum. and. I'm really glad I did because it's been one of the most fulfilling parts of my experience in college. Great. Well, thank you all for coming tonight and sharing your expertise. So, of course, I, I think many of our participants tonight are Science Olympiad participants. And for those Division B participants, they're going to wonder what is the Webb telescope going to tell us about the solar system event this year? How does the solar system event connect to Webb? Um, so I'm going to let you all take on that question for a couple minutes. Do, do, do you want to go or do you want me to? Uh, you can go ahead. Sure. Um, well, one of the really cool things about the James Webb Telescope is that it's going to allow us to have a much better perspective on exoplanets in particular. Um, an exoplanet is any planet that we found orbiting around a star that's not our own. That's not one of the planets in our solar system. So when you're talking about the solar system event for this year in Science Olympiad, the focus isn't just on planets within our solar system. There's also a focus on planets beyond our solar system, exoplanets. 
and how those planets can be similar or different to the ones in our solar system and what studying those planets can tell us about how our solar system came to be. So one of the great things about the James Webb Telescope is that it'll allow us to study exoplanets with a lot more detail and with a lot more precision. And in doing so, we'll be able to learn more about how those planets formed and hopefully that can teach us more about our own solar system. Uh, just building off of what Connor said, um, like Dr. Milam talked about in her presentation, the James Webb Space Telescope can also observe objects within our own solar system. So pretty much anything that's Mars and outwards. So it can't observe things like Mercury or Venus, but anything that's Mars and outwards is fair game. So um, as, as Dr. Milam was alluding to in her presentation, um, the telescope can give us some really, really important and useful like chemical composition information about like the atmospheres of different planets inside our solar system, or, you know, like kind of how their quote unquote weather is. And also for, you know, smaller objects like Europa or Enceladus, it can give us some chemical, some insight into, you know, the composition of the like vapor plumes that we get from their subsurface oceans. So the solar system event is kind of set up with this two year arc where in the first year, which is where we're at right now, we focus on planet formation and structure, which kind of tells the story of, you know, how do, are these planets formed and how does their formation affect the structure and the properties that we observe right now? And then next year, we're gonna be talking about, you know, now that we know how these planets form, how do we determine if those planets are habitable? And, you know, what does it even mean for something to be habitable? So after JWST is launched, hopefully we'll have some great data on, you know, the like chemical compositions of you know those plumes from Europa or Enceladus or something like that, and that could give some really good insight into you know are those things habitable? You know what does it mean for the, an icy moon that's you know really really far away from the sun to be habitable in the first place? This is great. I I will follow up with one other um, component that may be applicable. So as you talk about how planets formed or the solar system formed, the um, web has this amazing capability to study small bodies in our solar system that we can't necessarily do with the same um, sensitivity or at these wavelengths um, as we can with the ground-based telescope, for example. So studying things like in the outer solar system is going to be a capability we've never really had access to. So understanding um, the size distribution of small bodies within the inner solar system and the outer solar system. So by small bodies, I'm talking about things like the asteroids and comets and Kuiper belt objects, um, but also studying the composition of things like comets and asteroids will give us a lot of insight into the formation history of these uh, and what happened in the process of formation of, this, of, the, of our entire solar system. So the planets as well as the small bodies, because they're considered to be sort of the the ancient relics of, you know, our pre-solar disk or the how our planets were actually forming. So there's a lot of hidden information in them that I think we're going to start pulling out with James Webb that will give us a lot of insight, especially when we start comparison, comparing to other disks and planetary systems, as, as was said with exoplanets. Great, thank you. And let's repeat the same question for our Division C astronomy event this year. How does web relate to some of the things that students are preparing for for competition yeah uh so this was discussed briefly in dr milam's talk but uh james webb will be transformative for our understanding of young stars and planet formation uh within circumstellar disks uh this touches on a lot of the aspects of the solar system event but in the c division astronomy event this year we're focusing on the evolution of low and mid-mass stars and so we're including star formation and the initial stages of stellar evolution, including, for example, the Titori phase where stars are highly variable. And James Webb will be transformative for understanding the formation evolution of protoplanetary disks around stars and also for directly imaging young planets uh, around these stars and understanding how these disks form planets. And the accretion process in these disks uh, is expected to drive the strong variability of these stars. And James Webb will help understand and uh, map this accretion process onto the variability that we're focusing on in the event this year. And additionally, in the event this year, we're focusing on the full evolution of stars from right 
the, the early stages of stellar formation uh, towards the end stages of stars and um, their, their deaths and their evolution uh, through uh, type 1a supernovae events. And James Webb will also be able to study, for example, the remnants of type 1a supernovae and provide context uh, along with other NASA missions that are at, for example, uh, shorter wavelengths at higher energies in order to understand the properties of the emission uh, from, for example, the supernova remnants. Anyone else have anything to add to uh, what Tad mentioned about Division C this year? <laughs> Wonderful, great. Well, we have a million questions in the chat, um, and I think we're gonna we're gonna just have uh, Dr. Milam and, and if, if uh, we'll remove some pins here. Thank you, A team. You all are amazing for all of the work that you do throughout the year. So thank you. Um, Dr. Milam, one of the first questions that came in early on in your talk um, asked specifically about black holes and um, wouldn't a black hole form first as the nearby celestial bodies would gather towards it? If there was no supermassive black hole, every celestial body would move apart, not stay in orbit around that said black hole. Great question. Um, and it's not my area of expertise, but I'll do the best that I can. And maybe some of the A team members have some ideas as well. Um, I think there's a lot to a lot of um, a potential for how we may or may not be able to understand the first object, be it a black hole versus a galaxy. Because you're competing with different um, processes and and you know phenomenon. So you're, you're competing with the gravitational pull of all the mass of a galaxy versus the gravitational pull of something like a black hole. But do you need the gravity of um, something extraordinarily massive to start forming something like a black hole? Or is this something that has to evolve um, independently or maybe before even something like a galaxy so that it can help um, with galactic evolution? These are key questions that we don't have answers to yet, but hopefully we'll be able to track and observe different phenomena, not only in our own galaxy, but in others, as I was saying, so that we have a comparison and gain a fundamental understanding as we can look at different evolutionary stages of different galaxies with their black holes versus what ours is, and have some sort of idea of how to put the pieces together and move forward to the study of um, the evolution of these, these extreme objects. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we had a lot of questions um, come in from some students at Kennedy Middle School in California. They were the national tournament, Science Olympiad national tournament winners in the solar system event in the Reach for the Stars event last year. Um, one of the questions that came through was, uh, how long will Webb be operational? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, and first of all, congratulations on your success, um, but also Webb. Uh, so we have a five-year mission lifetime that we have been um, told that we have to you know, abide by, by NASA. Um, but we've also been told that we have to carry 10 years worth of fuel. Um, so hopefully we have a, a clean launch that we can um, get to our destination with all of the proper burns happening in a timely manner um, and in the right direction um, so that we get there without using as a, a lot of our fuel. Um, we are a fuel limited lifetime mission, unfortunately. Um, we have to have fuel because we have to be able to maintain our orbit at L2. Um, while it is a gravitational saddle point, we do have a giant sunshade on the bottom of our telescope, which actually acts like a solar sail. So solar radiation pressure actually pushes on the telescope continuously, trying to push it away like a kite. And so we have to actually burn fuel to stay in orbit at L2 about every two weeks, just correcting that orbit. But we also have to unload angular momentum. Unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which can exploit, you know, the Earth and gravity, um, we don't have that to unload our angular momentum. So we actually have to unload um, the angular momentum from 
our gyros uh, routinely as well. So we have sort of this operation and our schedule already built in that we're going to correct our orbit and unload angular momentum. But hopefully with efficient operations, and so the way to think of that is um, if you want to observe one galaxy in one part of the sky, and then you want to observe another galaxy in another part of the sky, you want to try to observe other objects as you move the telescope over towards the other side of the sky to make it work as efficiently as possible, as opposed to going from here to there, back over to here, back over to there, because that's just building up more and more momentum and stuff that we have to actually account for with our fuel. So hopefully we'll be able to operate it efficiently. And our current prediction is about 12 year lifetime. So and one of the one of the other questions that came from Kennedy was um, what materials is the telescope made out of? Um, a lot of materials. <laughs> um, as I, I briefly mentioned, we, we did a lot of work on lightweighting all of our materials. So the mirrors themselves, um, each of those segments are actually bored out beryllium. So you can almost think of it as like a honeycomb on the back um, side of the beryllium to make it strong but also light weighting it. So it's, it's almost hollow with just a solid, a very thin solid surface of beryllium as the front part of the mirror, which was polished. Um, and then the beryllium was just barely coated with a layer of gold. In fact, the entire amount of gold used for the full six and a half meter diameter telescope, um, if you condense it all out, it's about the size of a golf ball. So it's a very, very thin layer of gold that actually coats the front of these beryllium mirrors. The structure um, that actually supports the telescope is um, a sophisticated sort of um, carbon fiber that was um, engineered specifically for this project. And I don't think it's been released yet. Um, I couldn't even tell you the exact composition, but it's a very strong, lightweighted carbon fiber. It's probably, I think, a factor. Oh, actually, I don't know what the factor is. Um, in comparison to aluminum, it's a considerable factor uh, as far as weight with the same amount of durability and strength. Uh, the sun shield, as I mentioned, is um, a sort of a coated capton, uh, capton being like a, a fancy mylar. So again, thinking of your happy birthday balloons, it's very thin, but very durable sort of material. We need it to be thin because we have to be able to fold it all up um, and bunch it into a, a fairing of a rocket. Um, but we also need it to be durable so that it sustains things like micrometeorites as they impact it. Um, and we have multiple layers with different um, levels of insulation um, to help um, keep the telescope cold. Another question came through about the, the shape. Um, why is it hexagon shaped and not round? So segmented mirror uh, versus a solid mirror. Um, this is for multiple reasons. One, um, it was much easier to lightweight uh, segmented mirror. Um, two, it is easier to fold a segmented mirror. <laughs> and finally, it's easier to focus them. Um, so as I mentioned, each one of these segments has actuators on the back of them so that we can move them independently to make them operate as one. If you have one solid mirror with a flaw in it, it's hard to fine tune that, especially remotely a million miles away without an astronaut putting glasses on the telescope. Um, so by, by having the multiple segments, we could fold it, um, we could lightweight it, and we could actually focus and fine tune it as we need. And a question came through about the temperature that the telescope will be withstanding. Why does it not freeze uh, in such cold temperatures? Uh, so it's going to be extremely cold. Um, it's about 40 degrees Kelvin um, operating temperature, the mirrors themselves. So they will freeze. Um, or freeze in the sense that you would think. Um, the idea though is that there isn't any gas or dust in the vicinity of the telescope that will actually condense onto that surface. So as we start unfolding the telescope, we do so in a very systematic way. So we let things cool down at, at the appropriate time when we believe that the gas and dust from the launch environment, so the rocket, and anything that could have been in um, the, the whole fairing during you know, packing the telescope up. It's been in a, in a clean room, so in a very controlled environment. But all that air and stuff, if, we, if you cool it down really, really fast, it's going to basically make ice and frost on any cold surface. And that's just the nature of 
of physics. Any cold surface with any amount of gas residual in that vicinity is going to freeze onto that surface um, at its freezing point. And so that will happen. Um, but as I said, we're, we're hoping that we're unfolding the telescope and letting it cool down in a systematic enough manner that we don't, we're letting it out gas before we start cooling certain parts down. Um, so we want the sunward side to always be warm and we want the cold side to, to be cold, but we also want to get rid of all that extra gas and air that's around it. Um, so we do this at, a, at the appropriate times. Um, but if we do get something like ice on there, we do have heaters in all the right places so that we can actually warm things up and try to get it to outgas before we cool them down. Um, one of our biggest fears is um, contamination of things like ice and dust on the surface of the mirror or even on the sun shield because it will cause a little bit of background noise um, and impact the sensitivity of the telescope. So again, we. We've done a lot of design studies and trades and um, worked with the engineers and you know, thermal engineers to the nth degree to make sure that we know the exact performance of how this is going to work. And we've even tested this in, in practice. So, A lot of questions came through about what if something breaks? What if something happens? How, um, how is it going to get fixed? Will it get fixed? <laughs> Um, we are not fixing this telescope. Um, it is a million miles away. We do not have a way to get there efficiently. Um, we do not um, either robotically or with astronauts. Um, astronauts have not been that far away from Earth. Um, and so we are basically uh, in a design and control situation from Earth um, where we've designed everything and tested it in every possible environment and studied all the possible contingencies for something not deploying the right way or um, what we can and cannot control and how we can work um, any of these problems. So a couple of things that we've done is, you know, we put every single component of this telescope through the full launch environment. So simulating a rocket launch, simulating the cold environment of space when it's actually in its cold condition and operating things like the instruments and the mirrors in these cold conditions and making sure we know how to do that. Um, all of our mechanisms and deployments are actually controlled from the ground. Only two of them are automatic and that's our communication satellite. So we can tell what deployments to actually happen, when to happen, um, as well as our um, solar panel so that we actually have power and we can turn our batteries off after launch. Once those two things happen, every other deployment to unfold this telescope is actually commanded from Baltimore, Maryland at the Space Telescope Science Institute. We have a lot of redundancy built into a lot of these deployments. Um, so some of them have backup mechanisms or we're able to actually re-trigger a given mechanism depending on what it is. Um, and so we have a lot of control. We've practiced doing this and um, we've worked them again in all the right environments and conditions and they've gone through the full you know, environmental testing of the launch and um, deployment phase. So we're very confident in what's gonna happen. Um, also, in addition to that, we've been practicing how to control the telescope. So in the operations and control center, we've actually been practicing operating contingencies. So oh my gosh, one of the mirror wings didn't unfold. Um, how do we work that? We work together as a team with the scientists, with the engineers, and we actually try to figure out mechanisms or ways forward on how to make this actually unfold and do the things that it's supposed to do. Um, so that's something we've also been practicing. So I'm, I'm very um, I'm confident in everything that we've done to prepare for this and to put us in the best situation as possible. Things will probably happen, um, but hopefully we've learned how to work through them and we have the proper contingency in place. Great. And we have so many great questions. We're not going to be able to get to them all tonight. <laughs> um, but I think the last question for you is, what are you most excited about with the web and how will it contribute to the work that you do on a regular basis? Uh, that's my favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my research actually is the study of comets. Um, there's a lot that we can learn about comets. Uh, we think they're these 
I see relics or fossils from when our solar system formed. But we also think that they're really critical in bringing um, what we call volatile material into planetary or terrestrial bodies or other bodies even in the solar system. And this is something we've even actually watched happen um, right after the Hubble Space Telescope got a new instrument um, and they were still commissioning that instrument, making sure it works and design was right and it was properly installed. Um, a comet flew into the side of Jupiter. Um, this was called Shoemaker-Levy and it happened in about 1995, I believe. Um, and so this impact was huge. This was something we saw coming and everyone knew that Hubble Space Telescope had to be able to observe this. And so um, every, all the scientists went to the director of the observatory and they're like, you have to figure out how to do this, even though it was something they didn't even know how to do with Hubble at the time. And so this was something that they did and actually we were able to study um, not only the impact with imaging, which was incredible, but also we can study the composition of the impact. And we've seen that the material that from this comet that hit the side of Jupiter, we can still measure that composition in that atmosphere today. And we still do, we monitor it every year. We see how much comet material is still left in Jupiter. Um, so we know that comets actually deliver material. And we know that they're the most water rich objects um, in the outer solar system, but it's probably that pristine water from when the solar system actually formed. And so it might be a good source of water to bring to Earth, Mars, or any other terrestrial planet in the inner solar system. But with water also comes other organics, so prebiotic molecules. Let's think about things like carbon monoxide, methane, methanol, ethanol even. Um, there's some great organic like molecules that actually when they're in the right environments would be key ingredients to make more complex biological like molecules. That sounds really exciting. I'm excited for you. I hope you find the information you're looking for. Um, and I wanna thank everybody who was involved this evening. Thank you to our A team, to Aditya and Connor and Tad. Thank you to Dr. Stephanie Milam. Um, for sharing her evening with us. We want to remind you that the STEM session on space is coming up next week on the 15th. That will drop on our YouTube channel. So check that out. Connor is our guest speaker for that. Um, and if you haven't done so already, please download the MySO lesson plan for this month. It is all about space and uh, sign up for the STEM showdown at the end of the month if you'd like. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, hope you have some fun exploring some additional resources about James Webb and all the events for this year. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>